Ko Shore Savile Southern Cross, Ko Air New Zealand One, Nawaka, Ko Stella Duffy Toku Ingoa. I am a Pakaha Londoner. I am a Palani Londoner because I spent 18 years in Tokoroa. My dad was from the Wairarapa, he was from Martinborough. Um, anyone else here from Tokoroa? Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. Museums of inclusion, right? When I meet the generally Pakeha, generally upper middle class, if not just very posh New Zealanders in London, when I meet them at the nice do's that I get invited to at the High Commission, they say in their posh New Zealand accents, Oh, it must have been so difficult growing up in Tokoroa. I mean, you know, you're an artist, you're gay. And I want to punch them for their assumptions, and I don't. I say, you know what? We came from a council estate in South London. I'm the youngest of seven children. My parents both had to leave school at 14. My dad met my mother during the war because he went over to fight the fascists with 75th Squadron, New Zealand Air Force. They had seven children between them and five of those, the first five, lived in two rooms with my mum and dad. Not two bedrooms, two rooms in post-war London. They got the great benefit of moving to a council estate in Woolwich. For any of you who know Woolwich, it's kind of like the same way that people would talk about Tokoroa and as offensive. And when I was five years old, they moved back to my dad's native country because he hadn't been home for decades. My mother's parents were dead and my father's father was dead, his mother was dying. And they moved to Tokoroa because it was where they could work. And they worked in the mill. And in my primary school, we had 26 languages. There was Samoan and Māori and Fijian and Uwean and Cook Island Māori and I knew that they were different. And we had Swedish and Finnish and Swiss and Dutch and one of my best friends was a Welsh girl who spoke Welsh as her first language and we were multicultural before it was trendy. <laughs> we were amazing. We didn't have formal arts provision. We didn't have formal arts education. We didn't even have, we didn't have drama at school, we didn't have art at school. What we had was all these people who had come together to this very poor town. Well, in the middle it was, where most of us lived, around the edges, the people who ran the mill, they lived. All of those of us who lived in the middle, in the same, the matching houses, I'm sure you've driven past them, um, or that way, um, uh, went together, worked together. In my classes at school, because of the town, we were 70% Māori and Polynesian. I grew up knowing that New Zealand is multicultural. I grew up knowing that my Aotearoa, the one that I come from, has all sorts of people in it. When I was 18, I was the first in my family not only to go to university, but to finish school enough to go to university. And it was because I was the seventh, and it was because I was the youngest, and that's why I got that privilege. Not because I'm so much smarter or more brilliant than any of my siblings, who were all bright, smart people. I'm getting to fun palaces, you'll understand. We were all bright, smart people who had to leave school at 15, 16, because we had no money. And I then got to meet the Wellington people, who, like the posh Auckland people, didn't know where Tokoroa was other than a place to drive through. And they laughed at my Tokoroa accent. They laughed in my face at my strong, small-town New Zealand accent. And I want to cry at that because it's only 35 years ago. I'm 54. It's 36 years ago. It's not that long ago. But hey, the year I moved to Wellington was 1981. That's a great year to come from poverty and know that you want to make a difference. That was a great year to come from a town that was 70% Māori and Polynesian and know you want to make a difference. And that was a bloody good year to discover other people like me. Other queer people. Other people who wanted to make a difference. Other people who wanted to step up and stand out, even though it was hard for us, even though it was scary for us. And by the time I was 23, I was already too big for Wellington. There I was, a big 
mouth woman being all big and loud and queer and pissing all off for saying this, that and the other. And I moved to London, where at least I could be a very, very loud small fish in a massive pond. But fast forwarding to um, four years ago, I hadn't stopped wanting the arts to te reach all the people. I believed, coming from my background, that culture was for all the people. But I know as well as you do that it's not. That we haven't achieved it. That we have been paying lip service to culture for all, and culture by all, and culture including all, for decades. And our arts councils and our creative foundations keep doing this. We open our doors a tiny bit more. We welcome in one small sector of the population a tiny bit more. I am here to make a challenge, and my challenge is to rip down your doors and ask the people in to help you push out your walls. I'm going to show you a little bit of how some of us have been doing it, and I don't just mean, hi, I'm England here to tell you how to do it. I mean, I know you are all already doing this work, but the way we're doing it on Fun Palace is it's a little more connected, it's a little more joined up, and just like the marriages we were hearing about earlier, it's about working together to collaborate and being each other's path. We can be the hour for each other to make a difference, but we might have to be working together a bit more than we are now. Christchurch um, libraries, um, all the libraries of Lower Hutt, uh, the Murawai Surf Club, and the amateur arts groups of Waiheke made fun palaces in the past few years. So I can share with you absolutely their experience, but what I know is that they say exactly the same as every other place that's ever made a fun palace in um, New Zealand, in Australia, in Britain, um, all four nations of Britain, um, uh, uh, in France, in Germany, that if we place community at the heart of culture, if we stop reaching out to people and trust that their cultural expertise is as brilliant as everyone else's in this room. If we get off our soapboxes, she said from a soapbox, <laughs> and we acknowledge that everyone can contribute, that everyone is amazing, the genius in everyone, then not only will we make our buildings and our organisations more inclusive, we will make better art because it will be coming from everybody. Put up your hand if you happen to think that Mozart was a genius. It's a pretty common thought, right? Go for it, leave your hand up, leave your hand up, put your hand up, big and strong so I can see you. If you think Mozart was a genius. Now, keep your hand up. Leave it there if your dad made you a scale model violin when you were three years old. Leave it there if your dad was the best violin teacher, not only in the whole of Salzburg, but in the whole of Austria. Leave it there if your sister was reportedly a better composer than you at the age of 10, but she was a girl, so we don't know much of her work. <laughs> we don't know if Mozart was a genius or not, because we are not educating every child. We don't know if Mozart was a genius or not, because you didn't get a scale model violin from the best violin teacher possible when you were three years old. We don't know who are the most amazing artists and cultural creators in Aotearoa, let alone the rest of the world, because we are not including everyone. And by the way, fun houses are not about children, and they are not family friendly. They are every age friendly, and they are for every age, because I love it when kids are running riot around a place and making amazing stuff, but then I look at that and I go, what about that 17-year-old who doesn't want to be seen dead being mixed up with the children? What about that 55-year-old who had to leave school at 15 when they failed school cert the second time round and get a rubbish job out of the mill at Kinleaf like so many of my mates and that person who has never thought the arts were for them? What are we doing to include those people? What are we doing to include the 75-year-old who has never had the opportunity to feel that the doors to a gallery were open to them. One of the things that I am doing is sharing fun palaces with people. It's for all ages. And you know what? If, you're, if your inclusion program is just for children in schools, work harder. I know it's hard. I've worked in the arts for over 35 years. I've never had a proper job. I've never had sick pay and I've had cancer twice. I've never had compassionate leave and I've never once had holiday pay. I have been a freelancer for over 35 years. I know it's hard, right? 
and we can be brilliant. But one of the brilliant things we have to do is do it together. So, what are we? We're an ongoing campaign for culture at the heart of every community and for community at the heart of all culture. It's free to join in and to take part. You do not have to pay subs to make a fun palace. We support people around the world to create fun palaces because we are a British organisation funded by British organisations and there's only four of us and we only are paid two days each a week. Um, we, uh, we can only afford to physically support the British ones unless people do this. Thank you for having me. Um, and we, we support them by words, we have a toolkit. We support communities who have never created anything before to create. But local people as volunteers and we support major organisations like the South Bank Centre, the Royal Shakespeare Company, um, the Liverpool Everyman Theatre, the large print works at Leicester to create their own fun palaces too. We do it on the first weekend of October every year. All of this is available on our website. We do it on the first weekend of October every year because when we first started doing it, we did it in October. It turns out it works. Um, what, happened is, what happens is it's the gathering in time in the Northern Hemisphere and it's an opening out time in the Southern Hemisphere. People like coming together at this time. It's based on an idea from the 1960s from Joan, Th Joan Littlewood, the theatre director, and Cedric Price, the architect. And in 1961 they dreamed a building, a building to house all the arts, all the sciences and all the history, kind of like Te Manoa, huh? um, to house all of these amazing things, right? and it would be free to access and free to the people and best of all, it would be run by local people, for local people, because local people know what local people want and need. It would be hyper-local. And of course, it didn't happen. And they had Buckminster Fuller on their board and they had Yehudi Menuhin on their board and they had these amazing people and it didn't happen. Partly because in 1965 it was going to, 1965, it was going to cost five million pounds. But it says, and this is from Birmingham, it's from a, a fun palace in Birmingham made by three or four arts professionals, a local um, museum, little local museum, and um, a bunch of volunteers. And they're in a part of Birmingham that, as they say, in an area labelled as economically, culturally and educationally deprived, a fun palace says you can learn, you can have fun, you are welcome and you're worth celebrating. It works fine for the big shiny buildings, big shiny buildings, I welcome you to join in. It works especially well for the smaller places that think they don't have anything to share because it supports them in doing it. And when the big shiny building is brave enough to welcome in the local community who think they don't have anything to share, then it really takes off. Who and where? Fun palaces are usually made by teams. There might be a team of local people uh, along with a team of staff from an organisation, along with um, a few people, maybe a friends of organisation. A lot of the work we do is supporting friends of's to stop being gate holders and become key holders. To stop them going, no, I saved this building 25 years ago. I'm never going to let anyone else in change it. Um, to support people to change things. As you'll see, the big lot of green are libraries. People feel that libraries locally are amazing for them and that they own them. And I know that it's exactly the same thing because I've been talking to the Christchurch libraries and the Loyal Hut libraries people about it. What people generally don't quite feel such ownership over is galleries and museums. And one of the works that we do is to try and support that library sense, that sense of you're allowed to be here and it belongs to the community, to also help with other venues and buildings. One of the ones right at the bottom is a, a private home. Chris Wehid Pehana in Wellington made a fun palace two years in a row in a private home. She knew that she could take 24 people. She knew that uh, she wanted to share some skills. It's really just a jumble sale for skills sharing about arts and craft and science and tech and digital. And when we bring it all together, what happens is community. And so she didn't want to put her um, address on our website. I can talk you all through this at some point, anytime over the next three days. Um, but what she wanted to do was create something in her own home for her neighbours that she didn't know very well. So she got everyone's email address and that morning she said, come on to my house, bring the thing you want to share, bring some kai, bring something to drink. And they spent 12 hours together and she got to know her neighbours. It's as small and as simple as that. Or it's as large as Sheffield Theatres, the largest theatre complex outside London, housing 3,000 people in their fun palace, but not once putting on a play. It's not about the thing you do, it's about what the community do in the place that you have.
So they invite the community in to do what they like, to play with their lights, to play with their sound, to stand on the stage and share something, but not to put on a play. And of those 3,000 people, 70,000 had never been, 70% had never been to their venue before. And yes, of course it's audience development, and of course people bought tickets, but we don't care about audience development. We care about letting people in. You're welcome to use us for audience development, but please be aware that it's about community too. Diverse and inclusive. This is the guts of why I'm here. Sorry, I'm losing my voice after a lot of talking. As I said, Fun Palaces are made by teams, and what we know of 292 last year is that there are about 16 people in a team. Last year, 62% of maker teams included people from an ethnic minority. Not just one person, um, people. Now, bearing in mind that 90% of Fun Palaces last year, yes, the bulk were in Britain, but 90% were outside London, which houses most of Britain's diversity, that's phenomenal. Right? Imagine if we said that 67% of all arts and culture made in Aotearoa had people from ethnic minorities in those teams. Imagine if we could say that. I don't believe it's true. You can contradict me, but I doubt it very much. The conversations I've had in the past two weeks in Dunedin and in Christchurch and in Wellington and in Auckland. We can all do better. Because actually, 62% is great, but I'd much rather it was 100%. I'd much rather all of our maker teams, including those in the north of Scotland, which are pretty damn white and Scottish, included people from ethnic minorities, and I'm sure it's possible. 27% included disabled people. That's amazing, right? Over a quarter of the fun palaces were led by disabled people. I don't know if people in New Zealand are currently saying disabled people or people with disabilities, our term at the moment, as advised by our disability advisors, is disabled people. So just letting you know that. 34% of maker teams include people under 18, which is brilliant, and 30% include people over, over 65, but 14% include both. 14% include an intergenerational maker team. And our brand new statistics, some of you I know will know about the Warwick Commission's report from 2015 the awful standout statistic, and it was looking at British culture and inclusion. The awful standout statistic from that was that of all the funded arts and culture, all the galleries, all the museums, all the arts councils, um, all the theatres, because they're all joined up in, in Britain, um, and they're all uh, funded by the arts council, well, almost all, only 8%, well, all the, of the people who, who took part and engaged with it, the bulk of them, with the 8% of Britain who are the whitest and the richest. All the funded arts, all the funded culture, accessed by the 8% who are whitest and richest. And we know that's disgusting, right, in Britain, and we're horrified, and there's lots of people who've gone, oh, it's not quite that bad, I mean, they didn't, they didn't count this and they didn't count that. But now, if what you're counting is opera, art galleries, museums, theatre, and ballet, it's accessed by the 8% who are the richest and whitest. Brilliantly, Fun Palaces doesn't do that. And the work report also said that 2% of participants in amateur arts, which is as, as volunteer engagement, are from a black or a Asian. By Asian, Britain, we generally mean Indian and Indian subcontinent, so India, Pakistan, and other nations closer to their or Asian or minority ethnic background. But in 2016, or was it 8.5? It's a new stat, I only got it yesterday. 8.5% of Fun Palaces were made by BAME people. This is phenomenal in our terms, and I think, someone's pet, I think it's phenomenal in anywhere's terms. But I'm going to show you how we do it. Communities step up and join in when we ask them to. Communities step up and join in because they are the already engaged. They're the ones that you already know. They're the ones that you're already talking to. I'm not for a moment saying you're not already doing this. But when they come together to make a fun palace, they're coming together to do something that is slightly braver than you're normally asking them. And you have to be a bit braver and give them a bit more power in your place or your organisation. I promise you that's how it works. If you, if you invite them in and you say, but here's a stricture, and here's a stricture, and here's a stricture, and here's another one, it's not going to happen. If you invite them in and you say, what would you like to do in our venue, our building, with our organisation? Now, somebody said to me yesterday, but our building really is all brand new glass and shiny. 
It really is. And I don't think I can persuade our board that it's going to be possible to do something that is as dangerous and messy as genuinely welcoming in the community. And my answer is do it on the steps. Seriously. Do it on the steps. I've been having this conversation with the Royal Academy in Piccadilly for three years now. One uh, Regent, Regent Street. One day they're going to get around to doing it in the courtyard. Yeah, I'm having the same conversation with the National Portrait Gallery in the middle of London. The bigger venues that are scared that people are going to come in and mess it up, do it on the steps, and then prove how well it works because you'll see that you get all the people. Then next year bring them in. Yeah. The other thing is that you don't have to be in charge. Yeah? You can hand it over because people go, oh no, you don't understand, Stella, we're so overworked already. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's right. And your full-time job and your sick pay. Um, and uh, and I, I get it, right? I get it, okay? We're all overworked. It is really hard work changing the world. Yes? But if we want to allow rubbish like Brexit and Trump to happen, right? Or we suck it up and work harder. You know, that's, all, that's the only choice we've got right now. In 2017, it's the only choice we've got. We suck it up or we work harder at inclusion and diversity and welcoming everybody in. We get rid of our doors. I know I sound really lectury and I'm sorry. I'm just also really passionate because I am still that girl from Tokoro who got laughed at for her accent. And now they're laughing at me for this one. And when I go home to England, they're going to say I sound, sound really Kiwi. Um, one of the things I really like about this, that fourth step down, 68% of participants agree that this event makes me want to become more involved in local projects and issues. All of this is downloadable from our website. And when you go back and you talk to your local council, and they go, oh, don't know if we can help you with funding for that, go look at these. Um, and actually, fun passes don't have to cost much. I know ones that have cost a thousand pounds, I know ones that have cost 200 quid. I know one that cost 20 pounds, and then the next year they said, we're not going to spend any money on it at all. We will do it all sustainably with only donated and recycled materials. And they didn't. Um, uh, oh, this is the lovely thing from Murawai Fun Palace. They say that over the two months leading up to the event, they experienced an incredible display of community mindedness and generosity. They just put out a notice saying, do you have a skill you would like to share at a fun palace. Something arts, something craft, something arts, digital, and now we've even said bring in sport. Sport involves the body. The body is science and art in motion. It is, ask Leonardo da Vinci. Um, get it all in, because actually all of this culture is a Trojan horse for community. And when we have people engaged in culture, in community, sharing with each other, teaching each other, engaging with each other, then they show us what they need. And every time people have said to me, oh my God, it changed what we curated the next year. It changed totally how we did our public events the next year. Because they're learning from their community what they want. It means you don't have to do so much work. Pass it over. Great for makers. So the makers are the ones who step up, right? The makers are the ones who put their hand up and go, it's two of your staff or a couple of your colleagues or you go, oh my God, she's right, unless we change the world, it's all going to hell in a handcart. It's a couple of people, it's a few of your volunteers, it's a bunch of, I don't know, it's the local high school who needs to do something more engaging. It's the local senior citizens group who are really worried about their older people who aren't getting out enough. I tell you, so many fun palaces welcome older people and so many older women go, oh, but I don't have anything to offer. And then we explain about crochet and knitting, and how crochet and knitting patterns are digital. One plane, one pearl is code. It is, right? And then they suddenly think that they know something that no one ever told them they did. And then the 10 year olds go, oh, but I can't lead. We explain to the 10 year olds that grown ups really do want to learn Minecraft. <laughs> and to the code club, that they can lead it, who think that it's past them. And the minute we start doing that, that's how it becomes intergenerational. And we don't think that face painting is a good thing at all. Ever. <laughs> Enough of the butterflies and the fairies, people. Even if we are calling them Puriri and Patipayarihi. Enough of it, okay? Give the face paints to the children to paint the adults. If we want children to be cultural leaders, if we want children to step up, give them the materials and let them do it to us. At Brixton Library, 
the, um, one of the young library assistants revealed when they were trying to work out how they would run their fun palace. So they started by asking their staff. They started by asking their staff their secret skills. And one of the young women put up her hand, she said, well, I'm only here on a Saturday as an assistant, but what I'm actually doing is I'm studying medicine. None of her colleagues knew that because she was the Saturday assistant. She said, why don't I bring in my face paints? And they would all know Stella said, don't do face paint now. Um, she said, and I'll bring in my anatomy books, and because it's about art and science, I'll get people to paint their bones and their blood vessels and their sinews on their arms. And I turned up at about six o'clock that evening and there was all of these people wandering around looking like, looking like anatomy books, looking like living anatomy books. For her, it was a brilliant way to practice what she needed to learn for her um, exams. For the kids, it was amazing. They got to paint on the grown-ups and then the grown-ups just took over anyway and painted on themselves. Because people, people did some of them beautifully, like really beautifully, and others were just a smudge. But it was, the whole point was, they were allowed to make, face paints are fine, because you can wash them off, right? But they were allowed to make a mess and a play. And, if, and you know, Brixton Library is great, and it's very inclusive, but it's pretty serious. Not least because, um, it's, it's my local library, because there's three gangs of children. They are children, they are 14 year olds in these gangs, and they're from three different estates. And if they happen to be in the same place, it's, it's pretty brutal. So even the library is aware of having gang areas. But to use the library for something like this, to be really noisy and playful and messy and fantastic, makes such a difference. So one of the things that we get excited about is that often the makers are people who are already engaged. But you see that, 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 that um, second step there, 42% agree that a fun palace, making a fun palace, opened up new, new opportunities. They discovered they were capable of more stuff. If we want to enable culture to be not just us in this room, but to be everybody, and I really do. I genuinely think we'll get better books, better paintings, better films, better art, better everything, if it's coming from everybody. Then we are gonna to have to start handing it over. And yes, they will be at a different level than you are normally curating. Sometimes, sometimes they will utterly shock you with their brilliance and you'll go, why were we so foolish as to not bring them in sooner? Yeah, but either way, we will be doing our job as artists and cultural <coughs> activists, which is to serve, to serve culture and to serve community. Enough of me, this is some of the people who worked on Fun Palaces last year. enjoying what you've got, meeting new people, doing different things. Learning about people in a different context than I normally know them is really, really exciting. It makes a really positive difference in the community because people from different backgrounds come together, people who are in science and arts, they bring their talents together, they collaborate. At a community like Longside, what we have is a lot of people who aren't as likely to go into the centre of Manchester. So it's, it's hugely important that, that they're having access to culture and science in their local community. It's just license to work at a really grassroots level. We're not having to kind of uh, be thinking about getting loads of funding together to buy in artists. It's like, okay, who around us is doing what and can we, can we pull them in to share that? The potential is huge and, and certainly the variety, just looking around and seeing the variety that's here today, it's just amazing to show you what could be possible. I've met new artists from Gloucestershire that I didn't know about. It's kind of opened up a whole network of people. I think it can really build the community because you've got a lot of people who are maybe crafting on their own at night somewhere or building or hacking or doing um, digital stuff on their own and it's about bringing those people together, finding like-minded people, skill sharing and, and everybody getting together and being like the heart of the community. An opportunity to engage with a different um, type of person than they might normally in their normal environment. I noticed it's full of people who have hobbies and passions and interests that they want to share with everybody else. What I've really enjoyed about working with Fun Palaces is 
is, is learning more about the associations and the partnerships you can build. I notice the difference afterwards when you just realise that actually we're not lots of different people, but we all want to do the same things, we all want to learn and we all want to have fun. It doesn't matter where they come from or what nationality, race or anything else, everybody's just getting stuck in and having fun. And really inspiring as well, I think, to for us running it, to know that there's so many other people out there who actually who care, who are doing something brilliant today as well. We're not reinventing the wheel. Community engagement happens all the time, every single day, and it's amazing. You know, the more the merrier. The, the slides are great. The images, the stats are all there. They're great. I'm showing you them only so you can take them back as persuading material for other people and it's all downloadable as I said from the website. That picture is of um, a group of ex-servicemen in Thameside near Oldham which is northwest Man North East Manchester. It's a pretty poor area and it's uh, one of those areas they call multiply deprived. It's got no work, it's got people who don't, didn't have a good enough education to enable them to create their own work, it's got loads of poverty, it's got an enormous amount of child poverty. Um, because of that, it has a lot of people who went and joined the services because it was the only place they could get work. And now they've come back from wars and no one wants to talk to them. No one wants to talk to these men in their 20s and 30s and 40s who've been in the army in Iraq and Afghanistan for over the past 20 years. People don't want to talk to them. And these men have PTSD and they're trying to reintegrate in their community. And brilliantly, one of the ways they decided to do it was to run a fun palace with the local library. And the librarian said, what would you like to offer? And they said, no one wants to hear what we've got to offer. No one wants to hear anything we've got to offer. And she said, yeah, but what were you doing? And they went, you don't want to know. It was horrible for us and it was horrible for them. And she said, no, you did other stuff though, right? They went, well, we built bridges. We built schools. We fixed places that had been obliterated by the Taliban. And she said, great, bring some of those skills. Because that's building. And building is art and science. So they had a massive, you'll see it in the film, they had this massive climbing wall with, and they showed people not only how to climb but how to put up the pulleys, which is science. And they did it outside the library, between the library and the art gallery. And they got people going between and then they helped them climb because they're soldiers, they know how to do that. And then they built this wall and they built it and they knocked it down and they built it and they knocked it down. And what an amazing, what an amazing story about how community is, right? We build things up, we knock it down. We build something up going, this is marvellous for us, and then we realise it's got in our way and we have to take it down. And they had kids and grown-ups and really much older people lining up because building, bricklaying, that's art. That goes way back, yeah? Anything like that is is who we are. We started out by building shelters for ourselves. I mean, hearing about the Whanaunui, right? It's one of the oldest in this area. We started out by building shelters for ourselves on our land. So teaching people how to lay bricks, it's really simple, but it gave those guys who didn't think they had something to contribute, something amazing. And, it, and the face, I've got, we've got about two dozen of these faces and the people are all ages, but they look so excited to be building something. It's so thrilling. I know it's not easy being opening your doors more even than you think you already are. But it is simple, yeah? It's about looking to the community and saying who in the community would like to contribute something in our venue or our organisation. And now you're going, but I don't know how to program it. I'm going to show you. So, what I want you to do is I want you to turn to the tables you're at and I want you just to say one thing to each other that you would like to learn at any point in your life, anything. Just do it really quickly. Tap dancing, or several people yesterday said te reo fluently. Anything little quick, talk to each other. One thing. Could somebody uh, tell me something that they heard that surprised or intrigued them? Anybody? Yes, hello. Music, learning to read music, okay. Is there somebody in, who wants to learn to read music? Can you put up your notes? The person who said it, can you put up your hand? Yeah, okay, thank you. Is there somebody in the room who can teach this man to read music? Okay, can I have another suggestion of something you would like to learn, please? Yes, up there. We want two of us here want to learn nuclear physics. Fantastic. <laughs> Is there a physicist in the room? 
Is there somebody in the room who knows a physicist? <laughs> uh, okay, one more, please. One more from anyone. Someone right at the back, one tell me something you want to learn. I don't believe you don't want to learn anything, people. Anybody? Shout it out. Welding. Oh, sorry? Welding. Welding. Fantastic. Is there anyone here who knows how to do welding? Give me another one from over here. Somebody over here, Helen? Play the guitar. Is there somebody here who can teach someone to play the guitar? Right. You see how simple it is to program a fun palace. What you do is you say to whatever the community group is, what would you like to learn, or share, or offer? What would you like to taste? What would you like to experience? We get a lot of people saying, I could teach massage. Um, we, got, we get an awful lot of people talking about uh, skydiving. And then they go, great. Well, we're probably not going to get you to do that because the health and safety form is pretty tricky. Um, but what you can do is you can get people to bring along their broken Barbies and Teddies and you can get them to work out with a physicist about how much, how large that piece of cloth needs to be to go to the highest space in your venue and drop them down as parachutes. And then you can redo the dolls and remake them. And in terms of disability and inclusion, last year the PhD embodied disciplines students at Bristol University asked people to bring disabled dolls. So they got dolls that had had an arm broken off or dolls where the kids had, you know, cut their hair too much and accidentally cut out one of the eyes. And instead of saying, this is terrible, they remade the dolls into gorgeous, amazing dolls of disability. And then they shared them and they did incredible things with them. So they brought paints, they brought um, masks, they, 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 they made a joy of that. And that was for grown-ups and kids too. The whole point is, if we can do this this quickly, right, and one person wants to learn one thing, and if it's part, part, nuclear physics or particle physics, I promise you, there may not be a person in the room, but there'll be somebody else that they know who knows. What happens when you bring those people in is those people invite in new people that you will never know, yeah? So it's not just getting your own network, it's getting them to bring in their networks. And that's what makes all the difference. The other thing that makes a really big difference is, um, is sharing skills. So again, I'd like you to turn to your table. Tell people your secret skill, right? So my secret skill is that when I've had probably two glasses of wine, I can still do the splits. <laughs> 54, right? I mean, come on. Um, but uh, thank you. Uh, all right, I'll do it then. Um. <laughs> people how to do cartwheels and then we go back to Leonardo da Vinci and we talk about one two three four and we make it happen yeah and we bring in the art and the science together so but your secret skill might be making the best scones yeah your secret skill might be that you are actually a fantastic watercolorist your secret skill might be that you have a special way of tying up shoelaces just tell each other quickly <laughs> Surprised them. <laughs> what have we got down here? Identifying bones. You did find. Identifying bones. Identifying bones. That's a fantastic skill for a fun palace. People like a bit of archaeology in bones. They really do. Um, another one. Any any other ones? Yes. Making booby traps. Making booby traps. <laughs> Who's that? Who did that? Who does that? You have a booby trap making skill? You are the first female combat engineer. Oh my goodness. Okay, so not only are fun palaces great for communities, they're really great for staff. Okay? You go and ask your staff this, when you go back, you will discover amazing things about people your and, and, and your colleagues. And what this does is it builds staff support. But man, Booby traps at a fun palace, people would love that. They would love it. And also, you put them all around your beautiful, shiny concrete and glass building, but in places that you don't mind people messing up. And then you'll get people who are scared to come into your beautiful concrete and glass building, coming in just to do that. And then they might see the amazing artwork that you don't normally get to share with them. Can I have two more from right at the back? Any more? Shout them out. Yes. Roller derby? Well, hello! Um, a, a fun palace 
in Pontypris and Wales, very tiny, very deprived area. They're all, you know, look, there are shiny ones, but I promise you, the deprived areas just jump on this because it, it's free and it's really easy to join in. Um, they had two tiny venues that could only house like 20 or 30 people at a time. So instead of um, trying to have, find one bigger venue because they don't have it, they just did two little tandem fun palaces. And they got a tandem bike and some roller skates and they got people going between them. And it's, I mean, it's fantastic. You, you get somebody who can teach that stuff. Oh, by the way, in our toolkit, we have a downloadable risk assessment template. <laughs> I know, because you're all worried, right? You're like, she doesn't understand. She's never had a proper job. Um, and I've got, we've got, so we've got a downloadable risk assessment template done by our friend who does the outdoor ice skating rink at Somerset House in the middle of London. So if anyone knows about running with scissors, she certainly does. Um, and, and basically, then you hand it over. You hand it over to a, a younger member of staff who hasn't done that yet. At least the, the template helps them get started. Or you hand it over to um, a community member who wants to join in more. We've got um, downloadable letters to your MP. We've got downloadable um, press releases. We've got all of that. And we have all the design facilities, all of that available for people to just take from us, um, please and happily. The other thing to say, is that one of the reasons that we say try and do it at the same time is so we can support each other. The libraries in Christchurch were able to make a bigger splash by saying we're doing it all together. The libraries in Lower Hutt were able to do the same. If all of you joined in this year, I know some of you are going, look, you don't understand, we've been programmed for five years, Stella. Make a very small fun palace that lasts two hours and see how it goes. Make a slightly rubbish one and don't make it so hard for yourselves, yeah? <laughs> risk it being a bit rubbish in order to risk it being a lot amazing. I'm going to finish now. You are already brilliant or you wouldn't be here. You wouldn't be caring about museums of inclusion. If we do this together, we start making changes. We build on each other's changes and there's the strength in it. And now, because I'm just the girl who can't say no, Andy turned to me and said, are you going to do a Wyatta? And I went, yes, of course I am, Andy. Uh, because obviously it's a long time since I lived in Tokoro. So I'd like you to join in. And the only one that I know that I know the words without getting them all ruined, and because I come from Tokoro, is Pokare Ba Na Rotorua. None of your other lakes, thank you. We have to go with my lake or my Arawa neighbours will tell me off when I go and visit them on Friday. So, join us please. You're out, thank you.